Great. Thank you. Good evening. I'm now calling the Tuesday, May 16th, 2023, regular meeting of the Los Altos Hills County Fire District Board of Commissioners to order. The time is 7.11 p.m. Please note we are conducting a hybrid meeting which allows staff and members of the public to attend this meeting via virtual teleconference. This hybrid meeting will be video recorded and posted on the district's website. Because we are video conferencing, <coughs> excuse me, we will follow a strict protocol for the benefit of the recording. I will indicate when commissioners, staff, presenters, and the public will provide comments. And if you have called into the meeting and are not using a webcam, please state your name prior to providing your comment for the benefit of the recording. Please practice considerate video conferencing etiquette by muting your line when you're not speaking and limiting distracted behavior on camera. Now, um, again, the, the protocols for these hybrid meetings is all fairly new, so I have uh, something else to add here. Commissioner Tonka is, is participating remotely due to emergency circumstances. We will con first conduct a roll call of commissioners present in person, and then we will take action to consider Commissioner Tonka's request to participate remotely. This is new for me too. So uh, District Clerk Vargas, please conduct the roll call of the uh, in-person commissioners. President Spreen. Here. Vice President Sherlock. Here. Commissioner Basigi. Here. Commissioner McDonald. Here. Commissioner Tyson. Here. And Commissioner Warren. So we have five commissioners present in person. Thank you. As stated, Commissioner Tonka has requested to participate in this meeting remotely due to emergency circumstances as authorized under AB 2449. That's government code section 54953, subsection F2, capital A, II. So specifically, she has requested to particip participate remotely due to a medical emergency that prevents her from attending in person. Although it does not appear on the agenda, the board may take action on this request at the start of this meeting pursuant to government code section 54954.2B4. Remote participation for emergency circumstances is permitted because the board has met the requirements specified in AB 2449. First, a quorum of commissioners is present in person, and second, the meeting is properly set up for hybrid participation. The only requirements are that the board of commissioners must approve the request by a majority vote, and Commissioner Tonka must disclose that there are any individuals over the age of 18 present with her in person. Commissioner Tonka, please confirm there are no individuals over the age of 18 present with you in person. There are no individuals over the age of 18 present in person. Thank you. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct a roll call vote to approve remote participation for Commissioner Tonka. President Spring? Yes. Vice President Sherlock? Yes. Commissioner Basigi? Yes. Commissioner McDonald? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. And that action passes uh, five to zero with one absent. And let the record show that Commissioner Tonka is now present remotely for this meeting. Great, thank you very much. Thank you everyone now for I'm going to it. That's the first continue. time of that process. Oh. <laughs> so I'll continue with uh, the rest of the roll call for, okay. uh, yeah, for presenters, consultants, and staff. Uh, Fire Chief Kirkow. Good evening, present. Thank you. Strategic planning consultant, Scott. She is here in the chambers. Yep. <laughs> uh, Friar and Loretta engineering consultant, Jeff Tarantino. Present. Santa Clara County Fire Safe Council hazardous fuel reduction project manager, Armstrong. I believe she's here. Community education and risk reduction manager, Gluhan. Present. <laughs> Emergency services manager, BB. Present. Programs Planning and Grants Manager Woods. Present. Technical Analyst slash Project Manager Cronin. Present. Operations Project Manager Russell. Present. Thank you. Budget Manager Morreale. Present. Mm -hmm. General Manager Logan. Present. And Deputy County Council Forbath. Present. And presenters, consultants, and staff are accounted for. Great, thank you, District Clerk Vargas. We will now move on to item two, Commission President Remarks. I have none other than to say thank you everyone for being here as we navigate, again, newness of these hybrid meetings and everyone's got uh, you know things going on and busy. So I'm so glad to see everyone here, both in present and on video. So let's proceed. We will move on to item three, public comment. Persons wishing to address the commission on any subject not on the agenda may do so now. Please note, however, the commission is not able to undertake extended discussion or action tonight on items not on the agenda. 
Items may be referred to staff for appropriate action, which may include placement on the next available agenda. District policy is to limit public testimony to three minutes per speaker, unless the number of speakers requires the commission president to impose shorter time limits. Do we have any public comments on items not on the agenda? We, <laughs> do we have one? You may proceed. Hold on, hold on just a second. Make sure we have, do we have the, is the mic working at the. Mm -hmm. We do want to get your comments recorded and, and heard. So he's good to speak. He's okay. Okay. Yeah. Test. Another good improv. Great. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Alan Epstein. I live in the district. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. On multiple occasions over the last few years, I've asked about improving the search feature on the website. Um, there has. Sorry, I just thought it would fall off. <laughs> uh, and I'd like to ask again that the uh, district make an effort to try and improve the search feature on the website. I think it's important for transparency so that the public can find the things that they're interested in on the website. Um, I understand that the website uses a, a Word, WordPress um, uh, website, but uh, it turns out there are many um, add-ins or plug-ins, whatever you want to call them, um, that can improve the search feature. They're not very expensive. They're not difficult to implement. So I'm not asking for, you know, Google-like capabilities. I just would like to see that the district improve its website to improve its search features. So thank you very much. Appreciate the comment. In fact, I will also uh, provide some, that is also, your email is already getting some response. Um, had some email back and forth um, with our web technologist who is looking into what plugins might be available to be it would fit in easy. So that is, there is work going on, nothing yet. Can't promise anything, but it's heard and, and uh, we agree with the issue. Thank you. Okay, any other public comments on items not on the agenda? I'm not seeing any. Great, thank you. We'll move on to item four, agenda amendments and changes. Are there any comments from staff about changes to the agenda? And great, glad to hear, awesome. Would any commissioners like to make changes to the order of the agenda? Great, um, hearing none, then we will move on to item five, the consent calendar. Are there any comments from staff on any of the consent calendar items, A through E? Seeing none, that's good. Are there any questions from the commission on the consent calendar items? Wow, I will now entertain a motion. Will the commissioner making the motion, the commissioner seconding the motion, please state your names for the benefit of the recording. And by the way, uh, just to make sure, are, are they, is the camera working okay for everybody at home? Are they still it seeing? It is. Yes, it is. Okay, great. Uh, Sherlock moves that we accept the consent calendar. Thank you. McDonald seconds. Thank you so much. Um, the item's now open for discussion. Is there any discussion from the commission on this? Not expecting any. Is there any public comment on any of the consent calendar items? None in the room, none on, online. Great, uh, we will now vote. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct the roll call. Okay, uh, President Spring? Yes. Vice President Sherlock? Yes. Commissioner Basigi? Yes. Commissioner McDonald? Yes. Commissioner Tonka? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. And the motion passes six to zero with one absent. Great, thank you. We'll now move on to item six, the fire chief report. Item 6A is the monthly report for April, 2023. Uh, Fire Chief Kirkall, could you please provide this report? Good evening, uh, President Spring, Commissioners. Um, Corey, am I sharing my screen or are you gonna be able to put up the report? I'll, I'll get it up, give me one second. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, the report will be brief tonight, um, uh, 70 calls for the district. 
uh, two fires, uh, three calls in which a fire response was sent out, but two in which resulted in a fire. We put on the report that there was not any significant loss because um, the dollar value for one was approximately $40,000. And that was uh, a roof fire with uh, some a uh, little bit of extension. And the other one was electrical fire um, in the ceiling and attic space resulting in $55,000 um, in loss. Um, and those reports are, uh, they were completed on, or not completed, but those incidents occurred on April 13th and April 16th. So again, going to the second page, Corey, uh, again, showing 70 calls. We, uh, as mentioned earlier this year, we moved to a new records management system. And in doing that, there were some interfaces uh, in terms of programming that needed to happen with this vendor who produces our reports. This report is not produced in-house. It, it is produced through a statistician, a consultant outside the uh, county fire um, in terms of it's not a county fire employee. Um, and we did notice a glitch on this report this month. So if you look, um, everything else is good. We validated, verified the information with the exception of the table underneath the incident response count by hour of day. The table that we're looking at is the average response time analysis by unit ID code three. These are all only code three responses with lights and sirens. So again, your total responses is 70, of which 42 were code three responses. They were evenly broken up between the urban area. And this, of course, is um, the areas really outside of Engine 76 Loyola's area and Los Altos's Engine 75's area, with the rural densities being up in the hillside. Um, if you notice that it says Engine 71 had a response time of 604, and yet there's a zero responses, that's obviously not correct. When we looked into it, there was a glitch with the call in and of itself. Um, the way it came in, it was a freeway response. The address or the location was at 280 and 85. That was what the initial location was, but the actual location of the response was at 280 at Magdalena. And then it created another incident, which then got captured as if it didn't occur. So we're working on that glitch um, as we work through. Um, you know, this is the first glitch that we found in our public safety reports. But I think that given the fact that we changed over our records management system on uh, January 1st, um, uh, we're doing we're doing well. Again, we're just validating and cross referencing the stats to make sure that we're getting as accurate the data as possible in all the jurisdictions served. So with that said, again, your EMS calls are pretty typical, just hovering around 60% service calls, approximately 30% of the calls. You have your fire alarms and your fires there with a grand total of 70 calls for the month. And as we go through and um, again, be able to really validate this information, and this is what we do as an accredited agency uh, through the administration and planning division, um, we're able to find uh, any other problems that may arise with how our data gets transferred over from both county communications as well as from our officers in the field that complete the National Fire Incident Reporting System, that record system that I mentioned. Here on the last page is the distribution of calls uh, in the district. Um, and again, they're pretty spread out. You've had um, some incidents there um, in terms of the three fire uh, incidents uh, or calls that you see in the bright red, but really two were actual fires, um, and then the rest of them were, were located. Blue is EMS, fire is red, and then you can see the rest of the color code there. So that is the end of my report for April of 2023. Chief, can I ask you a question? So yes. in terms of the fire on Magdalena and 280, um, mm -hmm. the residents have reached out to me. So can you explain to me a little bit more about what happened in terms of the misunderstanding in terms of location and how we're gonna make sure that this does not happen again? So a lot of times when you have um, a, a, a smoke or maybe it's somebody sees fire, but they can't see where it's at, you'll have multiple reporting parties that are calling 911, depending on which tower they hit Sometimes it hits the CHP tower. And so then the call is transferred from the CHP public safety answering point to county communications. Sometimes it actually hits your Los Altos uh, uh, PD PSAP, and, which then still has to get trans, uh, transferred to county communications. And occasionally, depending on what, what tower they hit as they're driving down the road, it may hit a tower that actually 
pings County Comm. So as these calls come in, you've got a call taker at County Communications that's either getting the transferred call or is taking um, information uh, directly from the reporting party. And sometimes they don't know where they're at. So you'll get somebody saying that the call is at 280 in Magdalena, just because as they look up, they're seeing Magdalena, but really they don't know that the call, or excuse me, 280 and 85, but really the call is back there at 280 and 85. What we or Magdalena. So what we do is frequently we'll send units um, if, if that'll take one direction and then the other direction because we know that the freeway is fairly confusing for folks, and because the reporting party is not as accurate sometimes and on those uh, corridors as you would if you were calling from a home and saying that you had a, for example, an EMS call at your house and we know the precise location, it's validated, and you're not getting conflicting accounts from multiple reporting parties. Um, that's that's the difference between why sometimes the call starts out somewhere else and ends up being in a completely different location. Did that answer your question, Commissioner? Uh, yes, you did. But I don't think this home is visible from 280. I know where this home is. Um, so this, the one that I'm talking about was a freeway call. The one that I was talking about where engine 71 shows a zero response. That wow. was actually a freeway call. So and the other the two calls, for the Magdalena 285. So that one here, as I look at it here, South Omani, here's that one here. I'm, I'm looking on my, um, my uh, looks like it was off of Magdalena near Cold Spring Lane. Yes. Is that, okay. So um, that fire itself, in terms of the details, I will say that all right now, all I have access to me is uh, uh, what I mentioned. I'm not sure if it was the electrical fire or the roof fire, but I can get back to you, Commissioner, um, with a response okay. on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, Commissioner questions, comments? Okay, Are there any, any public comments on this item? Seeing none here. Okay, in that case, uh, we will now move on to item eight. Uh, thank you so much, Fire Chief. We appreciate the report. Uh, I'm seven. I'm saying we're now moving on to is the general manager report. General manager Logan, could you please provide this report? Uh, yes, thank you, President Spring and uh, commissioners and members of the public and staff. Um, I'd like to just start off with the first cover slide of the general manager report. Um, there we go. Yes, and this depicts some nice photos of the state of the city's event that. Uh, uh, the commissioners, some of the commissioners attended along with staff, and that was on May 5th. Um, moving to slide, the next slide, um, slide one, I'd like to take this opportunity to please have you welcome with me Fire Captain Paige Russell. And uh, Captain Russell is here in the audience tonight. Welcome. Today is her first day of work with the, uh, the uh, fire district. So we're very pleased to have you. And just to talk to you a little bit about uh, her position, she's going to be serving with the district as the operations project manager, which is a, a 0.5 or half time position. And the focus of her position is to assist us and help us with the development, implementation, and monitoring of day-to-day -day operational systems and processes of key initiatives and strategic plan goals. As you might recall, the project manager position has been vacant for about six or seven months. And that was a position held by Battalion Chief Dave Barnett who um, was in the position first as a consultant and then took the position and then left the area and resigned the position. So that position we've been doing without and uh, Captain Russell, we're very happy to have you here for part-time part to give us support in, the, in, that, um, in, in those duties. Uh, she'll also be working with the new HIZ assessment and rebate program, working with integrated hazardous fuel reduction programs and developing operations project management of evacuation routes and emergency access roads, temporary refuge areas, which have been on our agenda to do for a, a year or so. We've just not had the staff to be able to get into that area of temporary refuge areas, and that will be focused at Hidden Villa. And then Zone Haven, the evacuation plan coordination and evacuation road projects, all of these will be uh, items that uh, Captain Russell can help us with. Uh, also coordinating activities related to community strategic fuel break that will be coming online here very quickly with MidPen open space and updates on early warning notification programs. Assist with the implementation and revisions of the 2023 district community wildfire protection plan 
And Captain Russell, I think you and I met about four years ago when you had just um, taken on the duties of the county wide uh, CWPP. So we're bringing an expert in house along with uh, Eugenia Woods to work on our Annex 4. So very happy to have you uh, help us with that. Um, background for Captain Russell, 17 years career in Santa Clara County Fire Department and educational background, bachelor's and master's degree. And I think you're an expert in languages. So it seemed like that was your focus of your, of your studies. Uh, at, with Santa Clara County Fire Department uh, from 2014 to 2019, she was a member of special operations team deployed to multiple wildfire incidents, including the Soberangs and the Tubbs fire. And certainly that's going to be helpful to us here in Los Altos Hills. She wrote the department's first two year training pro plan in 2015, wrote the department 20 to 25 community risk assessment and standards of cover and has chaired the um, fire department safety Com committee. So with those kinds of uh, credentials, we're just very pleased to have you. So welcome Captain Russell. And on your first day, we got you off to a, a pretty active start. So <laughs> at least the emails work, very, very happy. <laughs> uh, other updates and activities. Um, these are now, I'm looking at page four, May 4th. Um, a couple of the commissioners, President Spring and Commissioner Tyson attended uh, Joe Submitian sidewalk hours along with myself. And that was a really excellent opportunity to talk with the supervisor. The next one that Supervisor Submitian will be doing, this is on State Street in Los Altos Hills, or Los Altos at the Farmer's Market is June 8th, 6 to 7 p.m. Mark your calendars. Wonderful time to uh, enjoy the balmy weather and uh, the wonderful experience of State Street Farmers Market and chat with Supervisor Submitian. Uh, May 5th was State of the City's luncheon, an opportunity we all got to meet and greet with local officials and legislators, including Congress member, member Anna Eshoo, Assembly Member Mark Berman, and Supervisor 5th District Joe Submitian. And then you'll see some photos of good time being had by all. And at the district table, we were able to convene the commissioners who were available to attend staff. And with the tickets that we had, we also were able to host a few of our volunteers who were very grateful. And it was wonderful to be able to host them at such a distinguished event. Other upcoming dates and activities, page seven on May 10th, um, the staff financial team attended the county FY24 budget workshop. And I have the link there that I would encourage all the commissioners and the staff to take a look at. The video time staff is three to 3.30 on the timestamp. It was about five, about 4.30 to 5.30 in the chambers to listen to the workshop on the budget that involved fire districts. So again, when you hear um, budget Manager Morali talk about um, the budget update. Uh, that will be a reference that you might want to go back and take a look at. May 15th, LAFCO TAC Countywide Fire Service Review was just yesterday. The consultant report is attached along with the uh, LAFCO Fire Review Schedule on page eight. And that um, completes my general manager report. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any commissioner questions, comments? Another busy month, I can tell. Uh, any uh, public comments or questions? I see one coming here in the chambers. I just have one question, if, whether you've heard anything about the operations fire study that the county's doing. Do you know anything about its progress in the schedule? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I haven't had any recent contact on the um, comprehensive fire study from the, from the county. But I do imagine, I do anticipate that that will be coming within the next month or so. I think they're a bit behind the process of, of the LAFCO study, but I'm not sure. So, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you for the question. Great. Any other public comments or questions? Seeing them online, great. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to item eight. Uh, this is receiving updates on the vehicle strikes, the district owned fire hydrants and fire hydrant projects. And quite a few items under this. Um, in fact, item 8A is an update on the Altamont and Black Mountain Road hydrants. General Manager Logan and also Friar and Loretta, hope I pronounced that right, engineering consultant Tarantino are going to present this item for us. 
Yes, thank you, uh, President Spring and Commission. I'd like to start off the, um, these items and then turn it over to Jeff Tarantino. But as you can see, we've had some activity on our fire hydrants, trying to protect them better with bollards and uh, participating with the Fire Prevention Division of Santa Clara County Fire Department to be sure that we are in tandem with them. And then also there's some items here with Persime Hills Water District. So I think with that brief introduction, Jeff, if I can turn it over to you, Consultant Tarantino, uh, would you start and talk about um, the, the first item, which is Altamont and Black Mountain Road. This is a report back to the commission. We talked about it, I think, two, a session or so ago, uh, and give us a ballot update there. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm gonna uh, share my screen here. Uh, let me... And so um, good evening, commissioners. Uh, Jeff Tarantino with Fryer and Loretta. Um, appreciate the opportunity to, to private, provide an update to the district. So first, item 8A, an update um, related to Altamont and Black Mountain Road. So um, just a little history. Um, the hydrant, uh, at uh, it's on Altamont uh, Road at the intersection with Black Mountain Road. Uh, it was hit initially in December 2020, and seeing the photo in the middle of the screen there, it was hit at night. Um, at that time, the um, check valve did not uh, operate properly, and so you could see there that Prisma Hills had to, uh, Water District had to shut off that, that hydrant. Uh, it was replaced, so the check valve itself was determined at that time to be, uh, to have uh, malfunction, basically just due to old age, so it was, it was due for replacement. Uh, and then in January of 2023, so a few months ago, that same hydrant was hit again. Um, the 2020 incident was a result of a vehicle traveling on, on Altamont and then basically, yeah, not, I don't know if it lost control or what happened, but basically struck the hydrant from the street side of the hydrant. Um, the event uh, in January of 2023 was slightly different. And uh, on the next slide, I have a have an image that I'll show. But the the area just off of Altamont is used for parking. And so in, in 2023, actually a vehicle basically backed into the hydrant as it was pulling out of a out of an informal parking spot. And in that case, the hydrant did the check valve did Jeff, I think we're getting a bit of a is it not getting a little background? Um sorry. Is that better? Yeah, it's skipping a little. Sorry, mm -hmm. it, it's skipping a little. Okay, um, let's. Uh, I'll, for the next item, I'll switch over to my headset. Um, yeah, maybe if you turn your video off. Absolutely. Okay. Let me do that. Okay, is that better? Yeah, okay. we'll find out in a minute. We'll find Keep out going. in a minute. Yeah, <laughs> sounds good. You proceed. Thank you. Sorry, <laughs> everyone's having technical difficulties. Yeah, it's it's the way of the world these days, um, and so so in in 2023 uh, the. The check valve did operate properly. It didn't initially close all the way because what happened was actually a very slow hit. Basically, a truck backed into the hydrant, dislodged the hydrant, um, and then tried to pull forward. So until Prisma Hills responded and pulled the hydrant off, then the check valve um, uh, was placed properly. So at that time, we simply replaced just a part of the break off um, uh, uh, break off uh, valve and then reinstalled the same hydrant. So because of the, the two incidents, uh, the commission asked that we look at potentially additional hardening for the, um, for the hydrant. And so what we did was, and on the screen here on the left shows the, the hydrant at, at the intersection of Black Mountain and Altamont. And you can see in the green shaded area that this is kind of an informal parking area and in the position of that hydrant, just, just off the road, but also in, a, in an area that is uh, potentially vulnerable for cars when traveling in the, in the uh, unimproved parking area. And so we looked at some potential alternatives for providing additional hardening. Uh, and we communicated those um, potential options to um, fire prevention staff. And actually just this morning, I was able to connect uh, with fire prevention staff. And so what the final recommendation will be to install four bollards, uh, as noted here in the image on the right. Um, so we'll basically the two bollards kind of in the rear of the photo will pro provide protection from vehicles pulling in and out of parking spots within the parking lot. And then the bollards in the in in front of the hydrant, so in the in the foreground of the of this photo, it will uh, provide protection from the road. So with that, I will. I'm happy to take any questions on item eight A. 
Great, thank you. Any questions, comments? Interesting. Seeing none, great. That, oh, uh, yes, just a question. Are the, these bollards, they're designed to to break if there's a giant impact, isn't that correct? Uh, that these are really designed to prevent backing into it, but not serve as something that would be a substantial barrier if somebody was driving at high speed, is that close? That is correct, yes. These are not designed for high speed impacts. And one of the one of the other items is uh, actually the next item, we'll, we'll see that case. Yes, these bollards really are low speed providing kind of a, a indication that that you know to a driver that hey they should stop but yes a vehicle traveling at high speeds um would would not um would not be stopped by the baller they're not traffic rated they're not um high speed impact rated great thank you question how, how deep do these things go are they just a solid piece of metal that go a foot or two deep are they in concrete yeah so so the the, the standard detail is it's it's a it's a three inch diameter hollow steel tube that is um, typically about four feet tall and then above ground and then below ground it's about a foot to a foot and a half and then there's a a, a concrete uh, footing that these that these are uh, cast into and then okay. the concrete is actually cast inside the the hollow uh, steel tube right okay great thank you any other, any questions or comments yeah this this will you'll notice it if you back into it that's for sure yes. Okay, great. In that case, let's move on to item 8B about uh, the Elena Road hydrant. Okay. So Elena Road hydrant, this is an update on an incident that occurred on April 12th. Uh, the, um, this was uh, just before the last commission meeting. Um, and so just speaking of bollards, you can see in the photo in the middle there, there were two bollards um, in front of the hydrant. The vehicle came off, came off Elena Road hit the bollard and then hit the hydrant. So you can see kind of buried in the dirt there, the, the bollard that was hit and then the hydrant is in the in the background there. Um, the check valve functioned properly um, and uh, it, we just needed to replace the break-off spool, the fire hydrant, and then the bollard. And so on the right, you can see uh, the, the replaced um, uh, uh, replaced equipment in, in place. Um, and this was all restored uh, within about, uh, it took a little longer because we had um, some contractual items that the commission helped us with at the last meeting, but this was this was resolved um, within several days. And with that, I can happy to answer any questions. Uh, this may not be a question for Tarantino, but do we, do we ever find out who did this? Is this a, do we, it's all known? Yes, I received the sheriff's office report. Oh. Um, it was a individual driver driving for his company. He was uninjured, but remained unseen. Okay, uh, oh, good. Okay. Insured. So great. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from the commissioners? Any other public comments? Seeing none. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's move on to C. This is about the Seton Road hydrant. Yeah, thank you. So the Seton Road uh, property hydrant. So this is related to uh, Prisma Hills Water District is completing uh, what they call their DEPS project, D-E-P-S. I, I forget all that. Duval, Elena Way, uh, several streets. Uh, and, and part of that was replacing the water main on the Seton property and installing a new hydrant. Um, the hydrant itself was installed per the plan. And uh, the 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 uh, on-site uh, property manager alerted uh, Persima Hills that they had some concerns with the position of the hydrant. And as you can see in the middle photo here, the hydrant itself is located just off uh, an existing interior road. And there's visitor parking directly across uh, in, the, in the background of the photo. And so what the concern is, and, and during site visit uh, with Chief Kuhan and, and Chief Cronin, we agree that there is a high potential for the um, hydrant to potentially be backed into as a vehicle is pulling out of the spot, you know, reversing and making a turn to, to leave the property. Um, another another concern is the hydrant. On the, so on the, fo on the photo on the right, this is the same hydrant, but just a different perspective. Just the proximity to the uh, to the road there, and, you, and what you can see in the background of the road is actually a service road where uh, deliveries can be made. And so we just wanted to make sure that well, the ultimate location for for ballers are installed in a manner that provide the most amount of protection from vehicles potentially pulling out of the visitor parking spots, but also not so close to the road that as any large vehicles um, are passing by that that they would it would clip those bollards. So we're developing a hydrogen protection plan in, in collaboration with uh, Personnel's Water District and County Fire. Um, we do anticipate 
to install two hydrants. Um, the final positioning of those we're, we're working through just we have a, a couple of constraints. There's if you see a little in the photo on the right, there's a little pink line there that indicates that there's some underground electrical. And so we're just trying to find kind of the, the best spot to provide the most protection to the hydrant and um, we'll be um, provide an update at uh, the, the next commission meeting. Uh, with Great. that, happy to answer any questions. Any questions or comments? Um, uh, Consultant Tarantino, I think you meant to say to install two bollards. Yeah. Is that correct? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I say two hydrants? Yes, yes. two bollards. Yeah. Apologies. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Understood. Thank you. Any public comments or questions on it? Seeing none. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, item D is the uh, Purisima Hills Water District Water Main Replacement Project Update. Great. Thank you, President Spreen. So as part of our kind of standard coordination and collaboration with Person Hills Water District, as they begin to develop uh, potential capital improvement programs, um, they will begin to identify, um, you know, improvements uh, in that, that the water main improvements will, will provide for fire flow, um, as well as any impacts to both existing hydrants, as well as opportunities to install new hydrants. So the, the, the project that Persima Hills is, is in the initial planning stages on, and, and I'm not sure when they're going to begin the design phase, but they're completing their planning application is there is a, what they call uh, CIP project 13-01, and it's the I-280 and Lidicote resiliency project. So um, in the in the middle image here, these um, these images are were provided by Pockport Consulting Group, which is the consulting engineer for the Persima Hills Water District. You can see that they're proposing a series of improvements and we're focused just simply on the area of Lidicote um, Drive and Aracadero. The project is a, is a much larger scope, but for this particular um, coordination, we were focused in this area. And they're proposing to replace um, uh, existing six inch and eight inch pipe um, with, with 12 inch ductile iron pipe. That's the DIP is ductile iron pipe. ACP, which is the existing pipe that's asphalt is, um, asbestos cement pipe. And there's a, a several benefits to the community for this project, um, including uh, elimination of what they call cross-country pipelines. So there's pipelines um, in some parts of the community that are not necessarily within the roadway, but were installed uh, crossing properties within easements. Those can be difficult to maintain. And, and at this point there, you know, in this particular area um, are coming of, a, of an age that, that re, um, warrants replacement. So as part of this uh, proposal, Proposed improvements. Um, there is, and I'll hopefully you can see my cursor there. Radcliffe Lane is a private road, and there's an existing hydrant at the end of Radcliffe Lane. And so we've been working with Persima Hills to find opportunities to improve access and improve, uh, take advantage of the uh, improvements that Persima Hills will be will be performing. And so through some additional modeling um, performed by Persima Hills, um, the image on the right shows a location for two hydrants that um, we will likely request to be installed as part of the um, uh, the future project. One will be at the intersection of Radcliffe Lane and Litico Drive that's labeled as uh, Fire Hydrant A or FHA. And a second um, we, we, we determined would be uh, an improved access is on a Rasatero Drive uh, across from Tracy Court. This is right at the edge of the Persima Hills um, service area. And this is adjacent. There's actually, you know, not shown on here, but there's actually a fire break that exists um, just outside the limits of Persima Hills. So this will provide a, additional um, fire suppression opportunities uh, for, for county fire should there be a fire in this area. So we'll continue to collaborate with um, Persima Hills as they uh, enter the design phase. You know, we'll, we'll perform additional uh, site visits with the uh, design team to, to formalize locations for these hydrants um, and uh, as they move forward in, uh, with uh, de final design and construction. Um, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions, comments? Seeing none here, any public comments? Nope, great, thank you, appreciate the explanation. Moving on, item E is the uh, annual pavement project from the town of Los Altos Hills. Yes, and so uh, the town of Los Altos Hills has uh, issued for bid um, their 2023 pavement project. It's a fairly large project, um, but uh, the, um, the 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 level of impacts to to our um, in particular 
fire hydrant uh, valve covers should be fairly limited. So currently bids are due tomorrow, May 17th, uh, 2023. Um, so they're, they have not selected a contractor yet, um, but in reviewing the plans that we were provided, um, it appears um, only the work on Parisima Road, which is a grind and overlay. So they're essentially going to um, remove some, some initial uh, asphalt and then put new asphalt on, on top of um, uh, the, the roadway that will require the hydrant valves themselves. So the, the all of the valves that are in the street have a cover on them. And so when pavement's done, sometimes that changes the elevation of the pavement. And so we want to raise or, or in some cases lower the valve to meet the new pavement. So in review of um, the, again, as I said, fairly extensive project, Persimmer Road um, has up to four hydrant valve covers that may be impacted um, and requiring to be raised. The remainder of the streets that um, of the town's project that are within the Prisma Hills Water District service area, so that's that's the area where um, uh, the the fire district um, owns and is responsible for the hydrants and the and the hydrant valves, and including valve covers, are using a process called microsurfacing, which is just a simple thin overlay, um, and will likely not require any adjustments to the to the valve cover. Um, in my discussions with the town's project manager, um, although they're bidding um, currently and expect to award a construction contract in June. Uh, construction likely won't occur until late July or early August. Um, so as soon as the town receives bids and determines who the apparent uh, low bidder is, um, they will notify uh, the district through me, and then the district can um, in, engage with the, the town's uh, contractor. This is similar to a process that we've used the last several uh, summers. Um, and so what, tip, what happens is that the, the the town asks that the district work with their bidder um, directly to to adjust any valves that uh, valve covers that that need to be um, improved based on the new paving. Um, so we'll provide some additional updates um, at at a, a future meeting once we are, are uh, alerted to who the low bidder is and and we can move forward with a with an agreement. And with that, happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Questions, comments. Seeing that all pretty straightforward. Thank you so much. Any public comments? Seeing none. Well, great. Thank you. I appreciate this. quite a long list of uh, hydrant issues this, this month. So uh, thank you, Jeff. Appreciate all the information. You're welcome. Thank we you. will now move on to item 9A. Uh, this will be receiving reports and providing direction to staff. In this case, it will be emergency services manager BB, I believe, providing us the first report or the first set of reports. Yes, thank you. I'm going to give um, my, my lovely cohort over here a minute to pull up slides. Can't hear me? Is that better? Yes, that's better. Ah, okay. I guess I can just start. Um, so good evening, President Spreen, Vice President Sherlock, Commissioner, Staff and Public. Um, this month's Emergency Services Manager Report will start by talking about strategic goal number two of preparedness and how district staff members and consultants contribute to the strategic goal. I'm doing a little something different tonight. <laughs> so, um, yeah, go to the second slide and then we're good to go. <laughs> the strategic. Wait, wait, um, oh, do you want to wait? Let's wait for the slides. If you'd like yeah, to yeah. Up. yeah. It's a night of technical gremlins, so let's let's uh, do the best for everybody. Everybody get coffee. There's uh, <laughs> macaroons in the back, bagels. Yeah, I can see that. Okay, all right. You go on the next slide and we're good. So this slide um, is the strategic goals objectives um, that kind of guide our yearly programs and events planning for both our community and volunteers. When looking at the four initiatives, the district staff think that each of these initiatives kind of as, as preparedness pillars, which support the strategies that you see outlined here. 
Um, my hope is to talk about these pillars and show the staff projects, time and energy that is put into utilizing the strategies laid out by the commission when it relates to preparedness. Tonight, I would like to start with the first two we call preparedness pillars. The first involves public and community preparedness, and the second is to, to support volunteer programs um, in emergency preparedness. Next month, I plan to report on the last two preparedness pillars, as well as define more of our processes when it comes to providing community education events, programs, and educational emergency preparedness items. I know we talk a lot about the end of the event and the pictures, but we don't talk a lot about what we do to prepare for these events because it does uh, involve a lot of planning. Um, the next slide. This next chart shows the planning process of how we look at providing these important community preparedness educational programs and events. We have an, a Los Altos Hills County Fire District communications team that includes Andrea Constantine, Sarah Henricks, myself, Jay Logan, Eugenia Woods, Denise Gluen, and Vice President Joan Sherlock, who has been a great mentor and brainstorm partner with our group. Andrea Constantine and Sarah Hendricks um, and some various staff, depending on our events coming up, um, work kind of more behind the scenes and we don't talk about them much, but I really wanted to highlight their contribution to a lot of our communication efforts. Um, we meet weekly and we go through um, discussions on, you know, increasing our communication efforts in regard to social media, email newsletters. By the way, did you know that our newsletter is available to be translated into 132 different languages on our website? I just found that. I didn't know if any one knew that. Pretty exciting. Um, we also work on creating our own collateral. A lot of things that you see that we show you, we have done from scratch. Uh, when I first came to the district, we had one trifold brochure. Um, and as you see, we share a lot of our brochures and collaterals that we've come um, out with recently. So they're both really pivotal to our district communications. Um, their hard work over the past year when it comes to community outreach and education, they research best practices, communication, accessibility, um, how to re-engage with community and community partners, and they're constantly working on new ideas and products that are dynamic, engaging, and informational that we utilize not only in our community education, but also with our volunteer groups. To better serve our residents with emergency communications and messaging, sometimes they're working late into the evening and early into the morning to make sure the latest updates are on the website and social media. So I really just want to thank them and also the district staff um, for all their contributions to our, um, our communication efforts with community education and outreach. Next slide. The second pillar I'd like to highlight is the support of continuing education of community members, specific to the volunteer programs that we currently manage. Um, you see we currently support our volunteer programs like CERT and Teen CERT to make sure they stay ready for action. The LAHCFD communications team has worked on new brochures for CERT and Teen CERT to help with recruitment. We've also been very heavily advertising the Los Altos Hills Activity Guide alongside Santa Clara County Fire. Um, we do a lot of social media around Teen CERT and CERT, um, keeping our website current with the latest um, places to, to sign up for these programs, going to in-person events that we utilize our, our, our collateral with to recruit. This has helped us add 20 new Teen CERTs and seven new CERTs over the past several months months. Next slide, please. With every presentation we participate to we participate in with community members and outside agencies, we also talk about our CERT and Teen CERT programs and how to join. A big example is um, our Be Ready, Be Prepared class. This is what we kind of call a precursor to CERT training. Um, that brought in 102 residents in the past five weeks. We had two um, programs. The second one brought in 30, I think it was 32. I have it up there. Um, so really proud and, and obviously a need that we are you know, giving to the community. Um, also, too, if you have a chance to see the town um, of Los Altos Hills activity guide, we've actually branched out from one page to a second page with a lot of our programs and activities that we've come up with. Um, one of those events, next slide please, is the Pathways Run that we participated in um, this past weekend. Um, it was nice to see some of our fellow um, commission people out there running and participating. Looking good, yes. Commissioner Tyson is always in there with the fire, he's awesome. Um, so planning for things like this take a couple months. We did start planning for this event on the CERT side um, a couple months ago. Um, I see Incident Commander Christine Fawcett, who's a CERT supervisor, did an excellent job. Um, we had 435 registered runners and walkers. And as you can see from the slide, CERT and um, the CERT hams have a signed task to help with situational awareness. So we had several manned stations. Um, I can happily report no incidents. 
Some changes we made this year alongside town staff was we did a new map. So if you had a chance to ever see the old map, we did a lot of changes on it. Um, we changed some colors, we changed some um, of the icons on the map. Um, that was a joint effort and our consultant GIS um, links uh, was able to help us remake that map and a lot of people really uh, liked it. Um, I also started to kind of ease the group into using ICS forms for event coverage. Um, I don't know if many of you know, but my past experience with medical emergency preparedness on the EMS side. Um, I used to do a lot of medical planning with um, Giants 49ers, um, big names and big stadiums. So I'm kind of starting to sort of gently get our volunteers into a space where they understand incident command forms. Um, that way, if anyone ever comes to our event, we can show them gladly our plans. Um, and also if they were ever to go for mutual aid support to a different area, they would be able to understand what the plans are there too and easily read the forms. Um, that um, also went very well too. Um, we also had our district staff table. Um, I'm giving Denise an acronym, C-E-R-R-M, blue hand. Um, and two teen certs and a couple other certs came to support our district at the table as well. So what's next? Um, we're currently in the planning, planning phase for community education, district community outreach at the June 4th town picnic. District staff and teen and um, regular cert will be out with booths. We'll have our cert trailer out there and have our electronic fireable system to train people on how to put out a small fire, which is a huge hit last year. Um, so we're really looking forward to be able to, um, to being out there again. Also, we'd like to introduce the new Teen Cert 2023 board to you all. Um, and then in closing, I'd really like to extend thanks to General Manager Logan, all district internal staff, and you, the commission, for supporting these very important preparedness pillars that we provide to Los Altos Hills residents. Your vision really drives us to be more dynamic, engaging, forward thinking in our community outreach and education and helps pave the way for putting this small district on the map in a larger community of Santa Clara County. Thank you very much and a report. Oh, thank you for that report. Any any questions or comments from the commission? I'm just gonna say I'm I'm so impressed. Over a hundred people in those two classes. That I'm just yeah. I guess nothing like multiple power outages to kind of make people think how important this kind of stuff is. Yeah, remember we always say never let a good crisis go to waste, and we haven't. So <laughs> yes. Um, you know, did you do something differently this time that you got more participation? What do you think made a difference? We sent postcards to every single resident, and then we actually did another one again saying back by popular demand. And we also have a really cool vehicle go bag that we're giving out, and we the fed them. So I think, I think the combination of all those things worked really well. But yeah, you know, really, um, we did a lot of like, how'd you find out about us? And most of it was the mailer that came to people's houses. So um, it was a really good learning experience. And every time we do this and see different kind of ways that we can reach the public to come, um, it's been it's been really good. So it's great. Yeah. Nice yeah. job. Yeah, interesting. Thank great. Thank you. Any public comment on this? Seeing none. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, moving on to item uh, 9B, which is the Community Education and Risk Reduction Manager events. This will be um, CERR Manager Gluhan will be providing the report. Maybe. There we go. Um, so thank you, commissioners, uh, staff. Um, like to go ahead and make this fairly brief. I'll, I'll have all the informations up there that you can read and some pictures. Um, the first uh, item is the San Antonio um, Hills HOA presentation. That was the first time that's been held in three years uh, because of COVID. It was not being um, done in person. I don't think they even did a remote uh, component of it. So it was really nice to get back together, very well attended. Um, the items that we talked about directly came off of mostly our trifo bro brochure um, and then projects that we currently have going on. It was great. We were able to introduce the Ravensbury and Mora evacuation routes. We had that map available for the residents to see. You can kind of see that on that table there on the the right, the pink showed the areas uh, that we'll be asking for ROEs. So we were introducing that concept. A lot of information around saddle, uh, Firewise, talking about Saddle Mountain becoming our first recognized um, Firewise community. And then um, talking also about the GOATS, uh, the strategic fuel break, because this is an area that is right, that backs up right up to this. The, a lot of these homes are in that area. And then we also talked about the new HIZ uh, rebate program that is uh, specifically for this uh, South District area on the initial uh, rebate phase. Uh, teen CERT 
and be ready, be prepared, which uh, Victoria just mentioned. And then you can see who is in attendance. Thank you for the uh, commissioners that did come. And then we had also representatives uh, from Fire Safe Council and Chief Gertgal shared our time and talked a little bit about the department and what they're doing through Santa Clara County Fire. Next slide. And uh, the goats arrived last Tuesday. Um, they are here. The grass is quite a bit uh, longer, thicker, and greener than last year. We had a little goat event. Uh, they brought more goats this year, uh, 500, uh, compared to usually three to 400. Uh, so at the town council meeting, I talked about that because that's a uh, burn preserve and people really appreciate that. Um, a lot of uh, interaction with some of the council members on talking about the page mill evacuation route. Um, again, we want, want to always bring up the HIZ um, program that we have here uh, that we offer at no cost to residents. And then we were just about to start the spring CERT Academy. So we talked a little bit about that. Now Summer Academy will be the next opportunity for regular adult CERT. And then as Victoria mentioned, we have the teen CERT program coming up. Next slide. As you can see, both of those presentations were a little bit of uh, the same thing, just a bit different. This was a really great event that uh, Victoria and town staff arranged. Uh, this was an appreciation dinner for community leadership. Basically, the representatives that were invited are people that are um, mostly currently involved in a neighborhood watch program. Again, if you pay attention to current events or you're on the uh, town council or the city council, you know that there's been an increase in burglaries. So that's really important for residents to do all that they can to try to make themselves safer. The uh, nexus in this is we wanted to say that, uh, yeah, we understand that the burglary is a very imminent kind of um, pressure, but we also don't wanna forget about the possibility of wildfire and being prepared. So a perfect place to talk about why go firewise. And we had a lot of really good feedback. We actually have out of this and some other things we've been working on three different communities in the pipeline uh, to become firewise. Uh, so we have that started. I have a, Victoria and I have a meeting next week to do a steering committee um, a presentation. So we're really moving forward quickly and then the other ones are in the next few months. So that was a great dinner, well attended, a very nice uh, event. Um, next slide. And then again, uh, Firewise update. Uh, we've had a couple of go, Why Go Firewise meetings. Um, La Cresta um, Firewise community, I don't know what they're gonna call it yet, but their watch group, uh, neighborhood watch group did a Why Go Firewise and then we have coming up a steering committee meeting with them. So we're, we're moving along. Um, one of the key benefits that were kind of uh, that changed since April is the insurance commissioner is offering insurance discounts for people that are participating in a firewise recognized community. So that is also one of the reasons that people may reach out to us in the future, but the, the really a, a good push with that neighborhood watch program and that dinner. So that was a really nice way to get some traction. Next slide. Oh, just real quick, go back. I'm sorry. Uh, as Victoria was talking about, if you see on the right, that's our new tile on our website. As she was saying, the support that goes behind all of these things that we're doing, um, having the fireway support, we needed to you know, bring that up on the website. We also did that uh, coming up with the goats. So that's actually the front homepage that you can click on and get right into our firewise information. Next slide, please. And then uh, flash mob today, we had uh, goats are here again, like I said. Um, so we decided last year, we tried to do an activity guide uh, trying to combine technology, social media, and um, animal husbandry <laughs> and grazing into an event is, is challenging. Um, the goats work on their own time schedule. Um, we can't say where they're going to be on a certain date. So this year we tried to do more of a social media event. Um, the goats got very close to where we wanted them to be, but unfortunately they were a little hike down the hill. Um, so we had a really good uh, talk. We probably had about seven people that we actually uh, talked with. And then we had a few more people that actually wanted the goats to be right there uh, to come and see. So I think we'll, we'll reevaluate. Maybe we'll turn it into, again, a little bit of a hike. I think we're finding after three years of coordinating this where we have like a sweet spot of about eight days or so when they arrive at the place. But again, a couple of years ago, they left early, you know, two days early. So we're, it's it's still it's still a um, you know work in progress, but it was fun. It was it was the people that came were very happy. We actually had Mayor Swan there too, so she got a lot of uh, information about uh, wildfire preparedness. Next slide. 
And here they are. Um, it's an IFR, I, HFR project. Um, I got a good term today, prescriptive grazing. So that's what we're referring. It's prescriptive, like they do prescriptive burns to reduce vegetation. This is prescriptive grazing. Um, you can see the statistics. We've been doing this since 2006. Um, we had the uh, duration being eight to 14 days. So that range, we're on day eight today. That range is again, um, you know, very big. So it's hard to decide where they're going to be. Um, the old map is there. Next year, we'll have a new updated map. Um, Jackson will be doing vegetation metrics. So we'll give you a further report on uh, what's gone on with that. Next slide. Okay, end of my report. If there's any questions, thank you. Uh, Captain Gluhan, were you able to get the photographer for the town crier? Yes, I did. Oh, and good. she got a great education in fire science too. She was so eager on Saturday to find those goats. <laughs> yeah, and she actually did walk down. They, um, they had the fencing up at the end of Burn Park Lane. So that was where they were last year. And then you were able to see them from at the end of the cul-de-sac there. Um, so they were like a day away from being in the exact spot we needed them um, today. It would have been a drive up seeing the goats by driving up. Um, but that being said, she only had to walk down to the bottom of the hill and they were just right there. So um, she did get to see, get actual pictures, and then um, really uh, get to appreciate some before and afters. I asked her to take the pictures of the before because then the after is going to be so significant when the goats come through. So hopefully she'll come out either while the goats are there or after and do some, some of that also. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? I'm really excited to hear about three potential firewise communities. That's really exciting. So Yeah. Go. And again, kudos to the town and Victoria for putting that. That came out of the EPRC a little bit of, of collaborating with that. And and obviously the sheriff's deputies talked about safety and, and it was very interesting. One of the residents said, well, this just seems like a natural combination. Why aren't you doing this? And I said, well, that's <laughs> kind of why we're here tonight is we want to introduce it. So it was a, a great opportunity for people to really see that that it's not as a as an apparent threat, but that that threat's always a potential and a possibility. Great. Well, thank you very much. Any public questions or comments? Seeing none, great. We will, in that case, move on. Um, let's see, this will be item 9C, which is the Integrated Hazardous Fuel Reduction Operations from uh, Technical Analyst Project Manager Cronin. Ryan, giving us a report here. Good evening, President and Commissioners. Um, if you'll Recall back in February, we had the six month presentation from Fire Safe Council about the uh, hazardous fuel reduction program, the, the chipping program. And back then we were proud to say that we had uh, about 31 yards per participant. And that's a, that's a good, good amount. And then we had our crazy winter, one week of spring, summer teaser, back to spring. And we saw the, the I had to do a, a I felt compelled to give you the information for March. And we saw there a banner month, um, 88 participants with almost 10,000 cubic yards. We jumped up to 113 cubic yards per person, you know, more than tripled. And I left you with that teaser of April. So if you recall this graph, um, my actual line of, peop of registrants went a little fire, a little further. Um, 88 in March, we had 140 registered in April. And so for the sequel, what happened in April? The 140 went down to 123, around 126. Okay, about a 10% drop off, that's typical. It's a big number, 14 people. We thought, oh my goodness, but we look at it, it's actually the same amount of percentage. Over 12,831 cubic yards the volume is still up. It's not as high as it was in March, but it's still over 101 cubic yards per participant. So now we're fortunate, okay, that the rains have stopped. So it's gotta be slacking off. Uh, this month we have 100 regist registrants. So yeah, it's slowing down, but it's still pretty darn high. So it, why is that? We're, we're doing some uh, data analysis. Where are these people coming from? Uh, are these new? new people that haven't heard of it before? Uh, are they just taking more advantage of it? Um, you know, and where can we reach even more? Uh, we have our, our weed abatement people that are being working, you know, uh, have requirements from the county. We're gonna reach out to them and say, hey, don't forget we have this service, we can help you with this. 
Um, so again, happy to be back another month telling you how great this program's running. It, I really, it's, and it, it's not mine. I, I kind of inherited it. And like I said, it's running really, really well. So thank you for Corey and Fire Safe Council and everyone that was before to set it all up. It's, it's just running really well. So uh, with, you know, with highlights, I want to tell you it's, it's going well. Any questions on that piece? Yeah, just um, do you think we'll be caught up um, before fire season hits or? Well, we're not leaving anything. We, we, we get to everybody every month. Uh, it it typically is a 14 day period. Now we have to go up to 21 days to get to everybody, but we, Still we get to everyone. Me. That's amazing. We've and then uh, I'm out of brush. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and there's a lot of other things going on with this, but uh, not, not for tonight's presentation, but we're, we're staying on top of it and make sure it's successful. But, and, the, uh, and the town takes responsibility for all the piles that are on the roadways, right? I mean, there's a lot of still um, trees that came down that they're just getting to it as they can. We don't have any responsibility for that, right? Important question. Let me follow up with oh, that. I don't know yeah, if don't we know. should be partnering with I keep them. seeing them and I think, um, well, I bet the town's doing yeah, that, but I'm not sure. They're so. still they have their resources. They're still they're going, yeah. Falling down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be yeah. interesting. And the county too, because up in our area, the county gets... I bet they don't do anything, but it might be worth checking. But they don't pay taxes to us, so that's another. Right. Not that we're not good friends, so maybe we can right. help them out with that. It might be worth okay. finding. I, definitely on Moody Road. Okay. There's quite a few stacks, yeah. That'd be good. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Oh, you have a question? Well, I'm partway through the process. I'm just amazed. I'm sitting here, you're 101 cubic yards per person. That's a phenomenal number. I have just mentally figured out my pile, which I've been really growing. And I think I'm at about 50 and it's yeah. a giant pile. So that's incredible. Also, I'm only partway through the process, but the sign up was easy. I got an email uh, or text uh, reminder that this is my chipping week on Sunday night or so. So I, I really like the more uh, hands-on kind of management. Now, of course, we'll see if I have a different opinion after the chipping, but I don't think I will. It, and it, that is an important thing. You brought up technology and not all of our customers are, are as uh, technically savvy. And so Corey has been doing some other reach outs and, and we, we handhold people a fair amount to help them out with that. Okay. And we're very responsive to calls and, and uh, concerns. Great, thanks. Are you ready for the next I report? Think so. any, any public comments, comments on it? Nope. Yes, you may proceed. Okay, um, just a, our update for Page Mill. Again, this is a maintenance of a, a evacuation route hardening and it is all on schedule. Um, you can re lead, read there the progress. It's just basically a checklist of everything we've gone through. We get down to the two upcoming. We have received our permit, have it in my binder here from the town, uh, Santa Clara County Roads and Airports, I'm sure is forthcoming. That's just a process. Um, so we are, we are moving right along. We should be getting our changeable message signs out there. Um, this was an interesting revisit uh, of this program. There was some some other programs that we integrated into, specifically um, conservation easements on property that are now called open space easements. So if you hear those, they are the same thing. They just did a name change a decade or so ago. Uh, county weed abatement came into pro program here. Um, what are their requirements and making sure that that's all clarified. So there's just a, some really good communication to clarify things for residents, for ourselves, and uh, to make sure that we're all in line with what our plan is. And it's, it's all worked out. We're moving forward with that. Um, I'm happy to say Huertas is one of our vendors. They were awarded the, the bid. They were the lowest bid. And this is the first time that they have uh, won an award for um, an evacuation route. They, they do our chipping program. Mm. So they're a good vendor to keep online. They, their lowest bid, and this is a good win for them. Uh, likewise, traffic control, this year, this, this project is gonna to go to statewide. They too were the lowest bid and they have not won that bid before. So we're keeping a good pool, we're rotating pretty well amongst our vendors, keeping people happy. We're not a big you know, buyer from stuff like that. So it's important that we have those relationships um, for future projects as well. And, and this was just a, a nice win for both of our hmm. bid winners. Um, with that, we should be kicking off on the 31st. Excellent. Excellent. End of report. Comments and questions? That's great. I appreciate information. It's interesting to hear about that. 
Any public comments or questions on that? Oh, oh. Eugenia has. I just have a. I just have a minor correction. Um, the media release had, did not go out on Friday. It will go out tomorrow, so two weeks before our kickoff date. And part of that was because Colorado was snowed in. Now I have the media release, and also so that we time it two weeks before the project starts. So just a minor date change there on the last bullet point. Okay, great. Good to be good to be accurate. And actually, good that we're seeing you here because now we're moving on to item nine D, which is uh, your item, um, which is. Uh, integrated hazardous fuel reduction programs, planning, and grants. Take it away. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everyone. And we're happy to announce our next evacuation um, route project is coming up within the next couple of months. This is the map that shows uh, Ravensbury on the left and Mora on the right, and it's connected by a trail that runs through Midpin property. This is our project map and these are the adjacent parcels and so we'll begin the ROE process that you've heard so much about. Um, and we've discussed with Midpin and we've been out on their portion of the trail. They have done a great job cleaning up their portion. So the connectivity is already in place between these two evacuation routes. We'll talk to our additional regional partners as we always do the county roads and airports, the town. The CEQA is in draft, so County Council will be getting um, our draft soon. Super great support there from that office always. Thank you. We'll also be submitting to Irene webpage in, um, images so that Fire Safe Council, as our co-project managers, can go ahead and get the web pages, project pages up. And then the IHFR team meets weekly at this point. And we'll be doing the target parcels that you've heard us talk about and begin the ROE outreach process. So exciting that we've, you know, got a robust enough staff that we're starting to get these projects closer together and meet more of our goals to get the maintenance and the new routes on the um, work plan. So next slide, please. Or do we want to introduce each one of these topics separately? Um, yep. I'll just any questions on the Ravensbury Mora Road project? Any public comments on that or questions? Seeing none. Okay, yeah, you can go ahead. So the next um, item under planning is our community strategic field break. We mentioned this a little bit um, last month, and you asked us for an update. So here we are. Midpin has completed their botanical surveys in the areas that were outlined in the August 2021 report that we gave to them. And it felt like we spent a whole year kind of waiting because we did. Botanical surveys, that's how they work. They take almost a year to put in place. Most of the plant ID is done while um, the flowers are on the plants. It leads to more accurate identification. And Midpin has several endangered species and sensitive habitats and protected ecosystems. So they are very thorough. So those botanical surveys is basically what happened to 2022 uh, on this project. Um, we have now been out to meet with Midpin, as Ryan mentioned last time, uh, last meeting, and we're beginning to map the adjacent parcels. So the map that you see, the thick brown line is approximately where the strategic fuel break will run. We're producing more accurate maps now that Midpin has begun sharing its GIS layers as well. And we'll have the areas that are not in um, dark green, not in the pale green and red. Those will be the responsibility for connectivity for the fire district. So majority of this is on Mid-Peninsula open regional open space land, and we'll provide the connectivity in areas like Hidden Villa and the residential parcels and the parcels that are adjacent to those areas. So we'll have basically two parallel projects running together that will equate to the community strategic field break. Um, Hidden Villa has indicated they're definitely interested. They've been anxiously waiting to join this project. So we'll be supporting them with CEQA compliance. That's not something that they typically do. And the next thing that will happen that you'll hear from us is you may recall that we hired, we went into a professional services agreement with 
do deck and it had six different tasks in it and each task was to be scoped and proposed and the proposal come in separately so we're now at the point where this is task three the CEQA for our community strategic fuel break and that proposal you'll see next month so that we can have that amendment and be able to put compliance in place that'll be our next step okay and that is the end of the community strategic fuel break any, you have a comment? Yeah, a couple yes. questions. So I'm just trying to understand the legend a little bit better. Um, so the brown is the planned, the red is our job, and the green is existing? Red is, could you put that back up a moment for me? I believe, working off memory, the red is um, the state responsibility area. You may have heard it referred to as the SRA. Okay. It is also... Uh, Mid, the light green they're layered on top of each other so the colors are just a touch muddy we're gonna that's going to be taken care of in our next map series okay, um the light green that's underneath the red is mid peninsula open space land so we this is a complex planning process because we're talking about lra sra yeah. open space land you know the hidden villa which is a nonprofit, and we've got then we've got our individual um the town county road all the connectivity there's lots of planning that that's going in behind this and i'm happy to say that this is something that um paige russell will be joining me on the planning for this project so exciting to have our new team member jump right in that's terrific i know that a lot of the people in my neighborhood who have questions about this so when the maps get better i'd love a copy so I can explain it better because this yes. is a real tough they, one for me. They to will explain. become available. <laughs> okay. Right. right. So this is a concept map from the boots on the ground walkthrough. And now that we're actually sharing GIS layers with our partners, the accuracy is going to go up. Great. Okay. Thanks. Any other comments here? Mm -hmm. yeah. This is a hugely exciting project. Since it was first announced, it was always this is a big one. So I love seeing this move moving forward in this way. So I mean, this is this is one of the best things to give residents confidence in what's being done to protect them as an entire town. So this is really exciting. Well, and evidence of partnerships. Exactly. Oh, it's huge. Yeah. What a web of of connection. Yeah. Great. Okay. I guess there's a. Let's see. Next is the anything on the community wild CWPP or is it oh the two eighty two I two eighty fuel bake project is the next one. Mm hmm. Again, that's slow hiding so you may recall that we had an extensive discussion at the last um commission meeting about whether we wanted to do a notice of intent and resubmit the uh project for the current round of funding that was triggered by the emergency declaration in january and was announced in march um under your direction from the last meeting, I went ahead and started to research that, get in contact with people, and really dig into the process. So it turns out that because we did that and we were proactive, that we don't have to submit um, a notice of, um, in, I can't remember the I, intent or interest, interest and get approval because we were a waitlisted project which you see the details on the right they were able to copy our existing documents forward you know through negotiation and working with the cal oes staff and management we got that request approved it wasn't an automatic process so the really good news here is we now have our i-280 project in the current waitlisted round of funding and the upcoming future round of funding and it's not going to cost the hundreds of staff hours that it took to put the application in the first time some of the other excellent benefits are the waitlisted project had the 10% match as opposed to a 25% match because it was um, an accommodation they made for COVID. So we're now able to preserve that opportunity to see if the waitlisted application gets approved, as well as, you know, be in the, in the current round. Um, and then finally, one of the other things that we talked about last time was the multi-jurisdictions. Did we want to reach out and decide if this should be a, a bigger project with multi, multiple jurisdictions in it? And the senior staff over at Cal OES looked at, at our application specifically and recommended against that for a couple of reasons, um, including that we would have, we can't just add jurisdictions to our existing scope of work. We would have had to 
broaden our scope of work. Um, and that wasn't recommended at the time. So this is all really fantastic, exciting news. We now have our project submitted in two cycles and didn't give up our waitlist opportunity while we were still able to jump into the fresh opportunity. And there's a second slide on this topic that gives you a little bit more information. Um, I don't know if it's coming up quicker for you guys. Okay, here we yep, are. No, we got it. Yep. So just to, to give you the next steps, the Cal OES review of the NOIs for people who are submitting new projects is current. And the RFIs request for information won't begin until August 2023. So we're kind of in that holding pattern again that happens with grants where they're collecting all this information and they're telling people, yep, go ahead and put in your, your applications. And then applications will be due in August. They'll start to do the RFIs then. So there really won't be too much news on the new funding opportunity between now and August. Um, then Cal OES spends from August to the end of the year this year doing RFIs, you know, screening things, making sure SEEK was in place. You might remember from last time that we had to do the visual impact assessment. So all the new folks will be doing that and we'll be kind of in the mix, even though we don't have to redo those documents. So they don't aren't required to move any of these projects to FEMA until January of next year. So this is, they get almost a year to move these, to examine these projects and then make their recommendations to FEMA. That's the part where we got recommended to be waitlisted as opposed to move forward. So we're, we're working in parallel here. We have these two things happening. And then regarding the waitlisted on the right-hand side of your screen, the waitlisted application, existing application, those awards will be coming in October and November. So the folks that weren't waitlisted have the opportunity to be awarded or, to, or declined. And then the people who are awarded, if they don't accept their award for some reason, maybe they changed their mind, maybe they've already done their project, maybe they don't have the, the um, they didn't get their sequel in place, or maybe their hazard mitigation plan isn't finished and ready, so they haven't met their requirements. So if someone declines their award, the waitlisted, the three waitlisted ap applications will then move up. So that's our possibility there is if someone in front of us declines their award. And then our waitlist expires in January of 2024. So we have basically the rest of this year, fingers crossed on our waitlisted application, and then we're, we'll be in next year's cycle for a regular grant. So I know that's a lot of mumbo jumbo. I hope it makes sense to all of you. If you have any questions, I'm happy to, to work with those. No, it's good news in general. Any, any questions or comments here? Thank you. Okay. I just wanted to ask. Please. I just wanted to ask, Monda, single jurisdictional, does this mean that uh, Los Altos Hills district will be the only stretch of the two, 280 that will be uh, essentially considered under this application? So the, our scope of work just included the portion of 280 that's in our jurisdiction. Um, we're the lead agency on this application. It doesn't mean that we're not working with the town and Caltrans and everyone else, but we, we're the lead agency and they're all supporting regional partners as opposed to having multiple co-leads. Okay, is, is that good or bad or indifferent? <laughs> just trying to find, I'm For just trying to Right. For this size project, that was the recommendation. Um, even though at the last commission meeting we talked about considering that, would it make our, our application stronger? When I got, you know, all the way through up to talking with Cal OES grant specialists, they said for our size project and the types of things that we would have to add to justify uh, a multi-jurisdictional, you know, co-lead type application, we didn't think that we would be able to create a scope of work that quickly um, to get to, to do that, especially since Caltrans work plans are typically two years or more out. So that would have been a much different lift. It wouldn't have been a reapplication of our same project that we've already developed. So in essence, this this potentially would culminate quicker to, to a result. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we may have completely missed the the twenty three twenty four grant cycle if we had tried to bring in um, regional partners and make it a multi jurisdictional, you know, co led agency application with people like Caltrans or other folks who their work plans are built so far in advance that they don't pivot the same way that we do. So, thank you. Great, thank you. And we would have had to rewrite the application instead of having it copied over. So that was that was another factor in that um, process. No, it no. doesn't mean we couldn't do it for the next couple of years in the future, but we would have missed this year's opportunity. Okay. Great. Thank you. Good. Okay, moving on to the CWPP. Yes, one more. Mm -hmm. We have a couple more slides here. Okay, wonderful. So there isn't anything new at this point to report on the county level. So that's why we just have a single slide. I've tried to respond by having the two columns divided visually so that you get these because you're getting these dual updates. But this month we just have a single update and it's just ours on our Annex 4. Um, DUDEC has done quite a bit of work in the last two months. These are the highlights of their work products. And you also have in your um, commission, your, your pack com meeting packets, a report, a one page report directly from DUDEC. And they have done the uh, vegetation fine scale mapping. They've done the community risk assessment when we've used zone haven zones to, to go ahead and divide that up because it parallels our firewise, it parallels the county level evacuation planning. So we didn't want to have a you know third or fourth or fifth, you know, kind of lingo and language and, and areas out there. So they took the zone haven layers for Los Altos Hills County fire district and broke the assessments up that way. We've got great maps coming. I've seen some draft maps. They're going to be very helpful. We're waiting to make sure that our maps synchronize with the county maps and also the new Cal Fire uh, severity hazard zone maps that have come out. So we're not sending out, you know, releasing those drafts yet, but they've also come into town and done the boots on the ground um, ground truthing of our, the maps and the hazard models. And then finally, they've begun to work on the documents, the actual documents and matrix for, within our Annex 4, based on the templates that we used in 2016, bringing those up to date, synchronizing the new strategic plan that's been put into place, because all those goals look a little bit, they're worded a little bit differently. We went from six goals to four, and then syn synchronizing again with the county level template that defines the GIS coordinate mapping and things like that so that all of our annex will also overlay with the county maps and projects. And here's my connectivity again, that's so important to making fuel breaks work effectively. So super exciting, all this behind the scenes stuff. And I'm very excited to hopefully bring you drafts by August. We're trying to parallel the county draft process. So. Great. So happy to take any questions or concerns there. Any comments or questions? A lot of progress being reported tonight. Thank you. Any public comments on this? Questions? Wait, we, have a, we have a public question or comment. My question is just how does it integrate with the hazard mitigation um, process that's going on at the same time? Thank you. Can you hear that question? Yes. Um, the county is updating the safety element and the multi-jurisdictional hazard mitigation plan at the same time that the C the countywide CWPP is being updated. And this is really exciting. The feedback that the county has gotten from consultants and other people is that, that we're one of the first counties who is, is producing all of these updates simultaneously so that their handshake between the documents is very strong. And on the county level CWPP, we have um, several people from the planning staff, as well as the multi-jurisdictional hazard mitigation plan staff. So 
this is, I really feel this is going to be one of the best CWPPs that's been put together. We're going electronic, we're stepping into story maps. There's, and then our annex has also been called the Cadillac of the annexes by folks at, at the, in the county update because of what we're personally, you know, the district is, is taking on and doing with bringing in environmental consultants and integrating uh, Zone Haven, which is put together from the county fire department. So there's a lot of coordinating going on in other places where it's in other places it's siloed and we're doing a lot of coordinating. It slows down the process a little bit, but we're going to end up with a much better product. And there's our connectivity again. So thank you for that question, because yes, it, it does have to match the HMP, even though wildfire is only one of the hazards in a hazard mitigation plan. It's one of our biggest hazards. So really, <laughs> really exciting to work Great. with all these different um, regional agencies. Excellent. Excellent answer. Appreciate it. Okay, I guess in that case, we will move on to, uh, thank you for for all those reports, by the way, all, all of this exciting stuff, so much stuff going on. Let's see, we will now go on to item nine, uh, on E, which is the HIZ assessment and rebate program update, which is coming to us from General Manager Logan, along with Santa Clara County Fire Safe Council, has this fuel reduction project manager Armstrong. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, President Spring, commissioners and staff public. Um, I wanted to take the opportunity to, before I talk a little bit about the HIZ rebate program, just to kind of pull together for you what you've heard in these very uh, extended reports. What we attempted to do this session was to have each one of the project managers or each one of the managers talk about what they're doing within their segment of responsibility. And uh, that was part of the pre-meeting that we had. And I think uh, President Spreen, it worked out very well. So thank you for your leadership in helping us rewrite that agenda. And uh, you see, I think the, the product that came from that as a result, which is you really get some of the in-depth experiences and in-depth information that goes on a daily basis that you may not know when you just go out and go to an event like seeing the goats or, or some of the events that we have. Um, what's really interesting to me is that um, Eugenia Woods has her hand in so many different things, if you think about it, and thank you for the question that really brings up the regionalization, is that she's working on CWPP at the annex level here, at the countywide level, the local hazard mitigation plan, which is at the county level. All of these things are coming together and really makes a stronger region and a stronger product that's for the public safety and we're so beautifully set as the Los Altos Hills County Fire District because it's just not something we put on somebody's desk and say, hey, take care of this you know, in the next couple of weeks. This is our mission. This is our core. This is embedded in our strategic plan. And so we're able to put the resources and most importantly, the enthusiasm and the organization and the connectivity to it. And I just don't want that to go you know, not said, because I think it's, it's very dynamic and it's very unusual right now in local government to see this kind of product come, come to fruition and to see the kind of talented staff that you have around who's, who's able to do it. The other thing too, is I know that the I-280, when you, when you hear the lag time, okay, we've got to wait to August, then we got to wait till no, October, November, and then January of 24, there's this, oh, why does it take so long? Let me tell you, it is going to snap by so fast because we have so many other projects that are going on. So you feel the rhythm of how these projects go. There's the I-280, which takes a significant amount of time just to get through the Cal OES FEMA process. But we're well situated and we're getting attention and we're getting a lot of networking as a result. But then what do we have on top of it? Community strategic fuel break. That's a huge project. And we're working with our regional neighbors. Uh, mid pen to get that going. The Mora Evacuation Trail, Ravensbury. Then we've got the Page Mill Maintenance. And then we've got all the things Anise is doing and Victoria is doing. So all of those wrapped together, you're getting a very vibrant product, I think. And, and the, Ryan is doing his project manager and Paige will be coming on. So I just want to, want to pull that together because I don't want it to get lost in all of the lanes that you're hearing about, that they all work together. So with that little speech, then I'll move on to HIZ and rebate. Any questions, comments? Does it sound good? I think you said some of the things I was gonna say actually. Really, I, I feel the same. I, I feel like the, the, the organization and the, 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 
the work the results are produced are very very dynamic as opposed to static. Yes, they're not unidimensional. People work together across the board, and it seems to be seamless. Even though individuals have accountability for for their own, their own segment, but this essentially the uh, the whole is much bigger than some of the parts. Mm -hmm. So those are things that I'm basically observing. I think too, what I'm observing is the cross-functional team ability of the staff to work together as cross-functional teams. And that's really you know, very notable and not often seen in governments or bureaucracies is to have that ability. So thank you for those observations, very much appreciated. Okay, um, is uh, project manager Armstrong on the phone? I don't know if she's weighed in or not. No, sounds like it. Okay, so on the HIZ rebate program, just as a quick update, uh, we're working, the team is working with Fire Safe Council to uh, launch the HIZ and rebate. We have a couple of signups uh, for that, and uh, some of the HIZs have already taken place. And so we're testing our systems to see how quickly we can get a rebate turned around, how quickly we can get responses back from our residents once the HIZ is delivered, the assessment to them, then how do they engage a contractor or a landscaper to come in and do the work, send us the photographs, use the technology that we've uh, devised through Fire Safe Council and then uh, get their rebate payment. So that's where we are. And I'm delighted that Captain Russell is here to help pull that together because we very much need that kind of oversight right now from a project manager perspective. So. Quick report and uh, more to come. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Any questions? Any comments? Great. Okay. Moving on, we have item 10, which is the financial and district clerk reports. And I believe this will be Budget Manager Morali for presenting this report. Yes. Thank you, President Spring. And I might ask Corey to just load the PowerPoint. in view mode or slide view mode. Perfect, thank you, Corey. President Spring and Vice President Sherlock and members of the commission, good evening. Um, April 18th was the last time we presented an update on the district budget. And tonight I really just intend to provide an update on the events that have transpired from that time to the present uh, time tonight. The district budget was, uh, next slide please, Corey. District budget was sent to OBA, the Office of Budget and Administration of the County in February, and the county staff followed with a series of questions to us. Uh, those conversations have continued uh, since our last commission meeting and included several Zoom and telephone calls with OBA representatives. Um, General Manager Logan, Financial consultant Vargas and I remained in constant contact with OBA to make sure that the district's budget was first properly received, uh, secondly, properly interpreted and accurately recorded in the county system. When one realizes that the county's uh, um, system includes $11 billion in financial entries, uh, developed over uh, hundreds of agency provided account codes, um, the process of matching dollars is really easier said than done. Uh, this is especially true when we consider that when one looks at the county budget, they summarize the numbers accordingly so into very high level categories. We are happy to report uh, given all our discussions that the county now fully reconciles with the district numbers as a basis for further discussions as we go into the, that we have gone into the workshops and we move into the hearings. Uh, in this process, we found OBA staff to be very responsive and helpful throughout the entire process. But the most critical outcome of the OBA meetings was learning that the county has altered the way it presents the budgets for all fire districts uh, in the workshops and in the hearings. And they, they took an approach that's much different than in the prior years. The county has decided to present a base budget at the workshops with a base budget being, de being defined as last year's budget increased only by standard operational expenses. All items defined by the county as additions or what they have called proposals have been deferred to the June hearings for de deliberation at that time. 
So this change certainly elevates the importance of the June hearings that are coming up uh, in just a month from now. Next slide, Slory, uh, Corey. This chart graphically describes the new approach taken by the county, uh, making clear that there is a significant difference, of course, between the CEO, county CEO recommended base budget presented at the workshop and the proposals that will be a topic uh, in the June hearings. Next slide. If we look at how this approach affects the number, this table describes the budgetary impact that this new county approach makes on the presentation of the district budget. Columns three and four of this chart compare the commission approved um, uh, LAH CFD budget that was submitted to OBA to the recommended base budget that appears in the county CEO budget. And that was presented at the workshop on May 10th. Whereas the commission approved district budget totaled $19,024,856. The OBA workshop recommended budget totaled $13,924,024. That's a difference of about $5.1 million rounded out. As we spoke to OBA, this, this difference of $5.1 million, which we know the components of, represents what the county considers newly added proposals, which will be presented and deliberated at the June hearings. I would not interpret these items as being reductions. I'd rather say that they are really a bifurcation of the district's budget between the prior year, fiscal year 22-23 base and fiscal year 23-24 newly added, added items. Uh, that said, though, the importance of the June hearings cannot be understated as these additions will be subject to approval uh, or denial, either in part or full. In the coming weeks, we'll be, we, we'll be working with OBA uh, to help them develop briefing notes um, that basically describes the components of the $5.1 million that will be discussed in June. And we understand that such a document uh, will accompany the fire district budget packages provided to the Board of Supervisors during the June hearings. And the next slide, Court. This chart summarizes uh, in the simplest form that I could make it, um, those items that are considered by the county to be newly added proposals and that the district basically is, is asking for. We developed this chart to make it clear exactly what remains on the table for discussion in June. Uh, we call these ask items and they include the $2.125 million to fund a central fire fire truck, $510,000 in district owned capital, $150,000 for a fire facility study, $1.1 million approximately in life and safety property projects and programs. That's what we recognize as the projects and programs have within the category of projects and programs that we have discussed so much this evening. $180,800 in consulting services to support enhanced projects and programs. And there's a myriad of other dollars, $208,000 in specialized services specifically for web development, HR studies, technical upgrades, and systems. We also have a request for 4.5 FTEs in the amount of $765,355. And essentially that request for FTEs from our perspective underpins the resources necessary really to accomplish many of the items that are requested uh, in the fiscal year 23-24 budget. Next slide, Corey. This chart describes what we know remains in the base budget as recommended by the county on May 10th. These items again make up the base increase um, and it, it adds in to the fiscal year 22-23 base of $373,277. They include um, fire prevention and medical emergency contract COLA adjustments, which are routine annual adjustments of $341,000. Uh, they did keep in the uh, base budget 
the proposed employee benefit contingency of $441,900. Included in the base budget is the district parcel study of $50,000. Uh, they also kept in the budget our enhanced training dollars of about $37,000. And of course, our normal current uh, staffing complement, uh, salary increases and adjustments, uh, including seasonal uh, as well. So if you take all this tally, um, these, are what's, um, these are the items that are included in the May 10th discussions that happened. And next slide. But really, beyond the numbers, um, district staff has spent considerable time when, in speaking to OBA, relaying the message uh, that our budget was created after many months of discussion, evaluation, and regional collaboration. The budget process is best described and best aligned to uh, the foundational organizational pillars described in the 2023-2027 strategic plan. Uh, much as uh, Victoria spoke to this evening as well. I would say in this sense, the budget is so much more than a, an accounting document. Uh, and I think it, it's best seen as an illustration of the community's long-term priorities. And this is the message uh, that we have relayed to OBA in our discussions uh, with them over the last several weeks. Um, as we enter into the hearings, of course, the challenge is to make sure that this message uh, does not get lost as we look at financial comparisons and percentages um, and the summarized fashion in which the budget document numbers are presented in the county document. District staff continues to emphasize the foundational importance of the commission approved draft budget, budget and that's a message that we hope reverberates as we enter the, the June hearings. And I have to mention, as I listen to the meeting tonight and all the presentations, it's really um, all the discussions that we've had from General Manager Logan, you know, Victoria, Denise, Ryan, Eugenia, from my perspective, that really brings our budget alive and really underpins the dollars that are in it. So with that, that is the update um, that we have uh, since our last meeting on the budget and I'm available for any questions. You have any comments or questions on this? I will make some holding back on my own comments. If anyone else has questions. Well, my question is maybe a general one. I mean, I recall even before the pandemic started, uh, the county was facing a giant deficit. And my reading is that there's a big deficit. There's a lot of budget closure issues. Are we caught up in a countywide effort to, to rein in costs? And even though we're not reflecting in any impact on a county deficit, are we kind of caught in that cost control mode? Yes, Commissioner. I would say clearly at the workshop meetings on February on May 10th, it was very clear that the um, the county discussed the budget challenges that the county is having at this time. They discussed specifically the deficit that, that, that they are facing, uh, which is somewhere in the range of uh, about $400 million. Um, that's very clear, not only in the presentations on May 10th, it's very clear as one reads the CEO recommended budget message. Um, are we caught up in that? You're, you're certainly correct. Um, we, we are certainly not adding to that deficit. Um, uh, as you know, as we've reported to during the budget, the, the district's budget is, is very sound from a financial standpoint. But I would say that we are included in that lens, overall lens uh, of discussions that the county is having at this particular time. Um, the other item that came up on uh, May 10th uh, relative to the districts, of course, is a very strong um, discussion of the South County fire budget uh, in particular. Uh, and that particular district um, is showing a budget deficit, deficit. So those discussions took place as well. In fact, uh, I believe they commanded most of the time when the fire districts were presented. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Toby, I see you uh, uh, thinking about a comment. I don't know if I should. Okay. <laughs> so the, the county. Uh, 
uh, I don't know if anyone can answer that directly. Yes or no? This is the appropriate forum for that, or it, yeah, I think I would classify it thusly um, because there are so many financial issues going on in the county, and as I said, we are a small part of that. Even though we have funds to cover ourselves, um, they are using this technique of drawing what I would call a somewhat arbitrary line of what you're doing before versus what's new, which again, doesn't really apply to us, but they're using that cleaver to chop off $5 million and which goes into a much riskier set of things for us to get approved. Um, and it's just a good reminder of everyone that, you know, we are not in control of the money that, that is afforded to us. Um, this is in the go and for all those who think, oh, the, let's get the fighters to do it. They've got money. No, we we are. It is it is a constant negotiation discussion to make the programs we do fit into the overall system of the county. It, this happens to be kind of a, a surprise because they've, as he has suggested, is a new way of them looking at it, and it does put our programs at a at, a, at risk. And I certainly so hope that when these move up the chain, we'll have a chance to convey the fact that this is a very strategically thought out proposals. Um, but, you know, amidst the $10 billion, you know, the, the small numbers get lost and it's a lot easier just not to deal with it. So uh, I, I, I appreciate the, uh, the lens with which uh, Russ has put our stuff in. This puts us at risk um, without it being a direct you know, uh, statement about us. It's just that part of going through the overall meat grinder of the budget system is that we, you know, things get ground up, and uh, and we're seeing that happen at as these things get rolled up. We're losing the ability to convey what the thought that has gone into it, and you know, we're going to have to keep speaking that at higher levels to make sure that you know, that goes through in our residents fully profit from the money that has come out of their pockets, so. Thank you. Please, Jim. Be close to the mic, if you could. I think what, what you're saying is absolutely correct. The problem is that I just listened to the segment of the discussion for the, in the budget workshop that really talked about the South County and the, their complete dichotomy for, between what they're having to face and what we are facing. So my sense is that I think, uh, uh, you know, we need to be prepared for somebody coming and saying, these people are in disastrous shape and you guys are sending in a bunch of money. So how are we gonna close this, you know, this gap? And uh, the, the solution has to probably be very creative. Some, some sort of so creative solution that doesn't damage us at the same time, potentially help them and get them off the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the <laughs> This is bad situation there, and they're basically, you know, they're walking the, they're walking the, the path to, <laughs> to bad, bad shape. All right. So, so unpredictable things can happen, and we're gonna have to. It's gonna be an interesting. As he says, June will be an interesting month, and these meetings will be very important. And uh, so we want to keep our voices there. And decisions get made quickly, um, and at high levels, it's sometimes that uh, we don't get a chance to have our voice in because a lot of people want their voices in. So. It, it's this is uh, this is why the the budget process is such a key one and and um, why we have such expertise brought to us to really help shepherd it through as best we can. Uh, but we are at the whim of a very large process right now and trying to support these wonderful projects that everyone here has reported on. You and you see how dynamic they are. Um, but unfortunately, everyone in the county is not listening to, the, to our meetings and listening to those projects. So. Um, we will continue to tout that, please, George. So, uh, President Spreen, what, what do you suggest that we as commissioners can be do to be most effective in furthering that message and, and uh, the positive outcome we're looking for? That's a good question. Actually, I'll turn to General Manager Logan as well if she has any comments, because right now it's not clear. Uh, because this process is, or this, this new way of framing the budget, it's not clear at how we should be talking to our supervisor, for example, at, at what point is it going to come through the CEO? What's going to come to the CEO and what's going to come to the supervisors? It's not quite clear. Um, so that's why I feel a little bit ambiguous as to where should our advocacy go? Um, I don't know if, you, if any thoughts are welcome. 
Um, yes, be happy to give my thoughts on it. I think, first of all, you need to look at what you have and what you've established. And that is a very credible fire district that has a very clear mission of prevention, protection, and building resilient communities, along with contracting with the fire department for the suppression emergency medical services and the traditional fire approach. So knowing your programs and knowing how the residents have responded to those programs and how the programs are growing, and then the credibility and confidence in the staff, you know, all of that's been demonstrated tonight and has been demonstrated every uh, meeting prior to tonight uh, when the commission meets. The other thing you need to do, I think, is really have a grasp of the facts. I can't say that enough. Um, Commissioner Basiji did what I think is very prudent, and that is he went back. He said, oh, I read the report from um, Mr. Morali, and it seems like there's $5,100,000 that may not go our direction. So he went to the budget workshop, found the link, and listened to that segment of the hearing, very important, of the workshop, very important to do that. And if you go back to my general manager report, it's May 10th, the link is there, click on the, you know, just copy the link into a, um, a web browser and listen to that uh, timestamp. Because what then, it'll change your lens. We're, the lens we're using is looking at the fire district. The lens the commission, the uh, um, board of supervisors are using, is looking at countywide fire services, smoothing those fire services, making sure the fire services are available to the areas that don't have the fire service, and that is represented by South County. They're in a structural deficit. They know when they're going to run out of money. They know that their roof is leaking. They know that they don't have the equipment that they need, and that falls upon the board of supervisors to have a strategy around that. So that's what the Board of Supervisors is grappling with. If you look at it through the lens of the Board of Supervisors that has to prepare uh, countywide fire services. Then if you go to the TAC meeting that was Monday, yesterday, a two and a half hour meeting that talked about countywide fire services, we heard unbeknownst to any of us from 33 agencies that there are 33 different sections of the county that really don't have assigned fire services. Well, that's, pretty startling. And so the consultant then is coming up with these recommendations as to what to do. So not only is, did it kind of take the mirror of the North County and the South County in the financial picture, but it also broadened it to the entire county that doesn't have services. So that's what the Board of Supervisors is going to be grappling with in, in my view. And that's also, I think, what the county is going to be grappling with through the LAFCO study countywide fire study, and then the county comprehensive fire study that's going to come out. So as commissioners, I would just say to be up, to read those, to, and, and I'll get you as much information as I find. Uh, we really do have staff dedicated to keeping everyone up to date, is just watching those segments and, and putting a different lens on, listening to the lens of what the Board of Supervisors are trying to do. Um, the, we're working with D5, our District 5 supervisor, closely. Um, working with the town, I'm working with Ed Chicada, who is city manager in Palo Alto. He's the representative for, for the North County city managers uh, here um, for the TAC. Um, so it's it's that kind of networking, sharing ideas. I have meetings now that are that are coming together, and um, um, just being a good partner, being collaborative, um, understanding the dimension of what is going on, and trying to look for win-win solutions. That's I think what we're all about here in this little local district, we got through the management audit that way. And I think that good minds and win-win solutions will prevail. I'm very optimistic about it. Great, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Such an important topic. So, um, okay, well, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Morelli. appreciate that. Uh, moving on to item Roger, 11. Roger, pu public comment. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, public comment. Please. Let me borrow your mic. Oh, sure. I, I think the district has its um, uh, a, a difficult task ahead. I think Mr. Morales did an excellent job of identifying the differences between the county's budget and the, and the district's budget. Um, I would like to know if he knows whether or not the other fire districts were treated the same way. 
That is, they turned in a budget that didn't appear in the budget book. Because I've read the county's budget book and I asked the question immediately when I saw the county's budget book, it didn't tie to the fire district's um, proposed budget. And um, what I think is a disservice of OBA is how do the supervisors know about this difference? And so I watched the May 10th uh, meeting and I was quite surprised to hear all the discussion about South County. I understand the difficulty they have. They got leaking roofs, they have old equipment, but there was a $5 million difference between the budget that the commissioners turned in and the one that appeared in the county's budget. And yet there was no discussion about Los Altos Hills County Fire District. So I was surprised, I was literally surprised by that because what was the purpose of these meetings? I thought the purpose of these meetings was to tee up some of the differences. So my question is, is how are the supervisors going to know going into the meeting in June that there's this difference? How are they going to know all the things that, all the things that the general manager has talked about as to you know, why, these things are, why these things are necessary? Um, a doubling of staff at this time, and that's what the commission has asked for basically is a doubling of staff is totally out of line with what other um, county agencies are experiencing at this point in time. If you look at the budget, the, the county budget is just a very small increase. So to achieve that objective, I think this commission is going to have to demonstrate very forcibly, you know, what programs won't occur without this additional staff? What things are gonna be put in jeopardy if you don't have this additional staff? Because otherwise I think it's gonna be very difficult for um, the uh, county supervisors to understand why it's so important um, to, add, to add this additional staffing. A fire truck, I think is, you know, the fire department, central fire can explain why it's necessary to have a fire truck. But you know, staffing is a different issue. Pro programs, you know, is is a different issue, and I think it's incumbent upon the the, the commission to demonstrate to the county supervisors uh, why why that's necessary. But I really feel the budget did a disservice to the commission. I think it did a disservice to the to the supervisors. And I'd like to know whether or not other fire districts were, were treated differently. Um, I guess. Uh, so I think uh, we have our uh, task cut out. The other thing that I'll say is the budget didn't show how much money any of the fire districts had. And we have, this district has almost $40 million. So um, as, as was pointed out, it will have no impact on the county's budget, whether or not we get the additional monies that we've asked for or not. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any response there, uh, Russ? Yes, President Spreen, uh, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Epstein, for your questions and comments. Um, my understanding is that the other fire districts were all uh, dealt with similar, similarly as we are. So all fire districts are being handled uh, in, the, in the same way. So that, that, is, that is correct from that, from that standpoint. Um, you're also correct, the $5,100,000 um, is isolated and going to be heard at the next hearings. Um, General Manager Logan, myself, and Corey, we are working with OBA. It is our understanding that briefing notes of some type are being created um, that will be, again, given to the Board of Supervisors that then explains the essence of the $5.1 million of new proposed items. So we, we will work very hard in making sure that that message is relayed um, to the extent that we can in those briefing notes. Um, but um, you're correct, Mr. Epstein, it, it makes it more of a challenge uh, because the two numbers uh, are being presented at two different times. But we will spend uh, as much time as we can uh, on these briefing notes um, and make sure that they're as illustrative as possible. And as we get into the next item on the agenda after this, um, it's also the reason why um, the budget document has been revised as well and enhanced to portray our message uh, as well. So that those are my um, responses to um, those comments. I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Um, right, let's move on now to item 9B, which is uh, receiving the 2023-24 draft budget narrative. Okay, there's no presentation for this, but I'll, I'll basically speak to it. Sure. Um, uh, President Spreen and Vice President uh, Sherlock uh, and all commissioners, hello again. Uh, this agenda, 
item is not as so much a reporting presentation as it is an introduction to the fiscal year 23-24 draft budget document, really for your reading and review over time over the next several weeks. Um, the fiscal year 23-24 draft budget is presented uh, and attached to your package in full published format. Um, we've gone to great lengths to uh, update the document's design, and our focus was to enhance its presentation for what we hope is improved clarity and ease of, ease of reading. Um, we also want to make it accessible at this time to all interested party, all our regional partners and the public, of course. Um, and this is also an important factor as we approach the county uh, hearings in June. Um, hopefully um, this document is available. It'll be I suspect posted to our website and made available so the county can also uh, look at it and really see the um, engine underneath the hood that represents um, our budget. We hope that the updated design optimizes transparency as well uh, and communicates a clear message uh, of the district's mission and objectives. Um, as you look at this over the next uh, few weeks, uh, some of the new features um, in the budget include, uh, we formalized a budget message. Um, we included an introductory section that includes high-level fiscal highlights. Uh, we made it as, as abundantly clear as we could that the budget does integrate with the district's strategic plan. We included what we believe is more illustrative charts and graphs. And in essence, we tried to take a telescopic approach uh, going from summary to detail uh, as you go through the document. But we also didn't lose the benefit of what I think was really important to include in the prior years, um, the account detail, because in essence, uh, beyond just being a document that highlights a, a theme, um, this is also a working document. And as it's adopted and put in the hands of staff next year, they will also use it um, by, as, by looking at each account line item and understanding what in essence was put in into it. So it's not only a, a, a public presentation of our fiscal plan, but it's also a working document. And so with that, um, we really hope you enjoy reading it and we look forward to your comments in the next uh, few weeks and suggestions as to how we can make this document uh, uh, better um, at this point. And that ends my presentation. Great, thank you. I'm glad you, I'm glad you highlighted it. It's important for everyone to look at it and read it and really have good comments on it. Any comments here tonight? Great, thank you. Any public comments about that? Right wow, that, that, uh, I hope you could hear that. Uh, it was a very positive public comment. Um, oh, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, great. Um, moving on to item 11, uh, commission member reports. Uh, any about, uh, this is an opportunity for commissioners to provide reports on any future agenda topics. Any comments from the commission or about future agenda topics? It's always a fairly light item here. Any public comment for future commission topics? Seeing none, we'll move on to item 11B, which uh, defines our next meeting, which is regularly scheduled meeting at June 20, uh, in person and hybrid to be held here in the town hall council chambers. Uh, 11B is a notice that uh, it will be in person hybrid. Any additional comments from the commission about that meeting? Any, any other comments on people's attendance on that? Should be no problem with that. Any public comment on that scheduling? When is the schedule for the supervisor's hearing on the fire district? What is that date? June 15th, in the afternoon for Thursday. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, in that case, now we will move on to item 12, which is a closed session, uh, performance employee performance evaluation. Let's see here. The commission is now going to adjourn to a closed session. But before we join the closed session, is there any public comment on the item? I wouldn't expect there, but great. Um, thank you. Uh, the commissioners, consultant Scott and deputy council, county council Forbath will now adjourn to the closed session. Commissioners, you should have received a separate email from consultant Scott with the meeting information. We will, uh, I guess, Kavita will be rejoining Zoom with her while we will be uh, moving into the back back room uh, for a, a closed session meeting. Uh, after that, we will return to open session to announce any reportable action 
and then move on to the following item to adjourn the meeting. Members of the public and other attendees, you are welcome to remain either here or on the call during the closed session. District Clerk Vargas, please note for the record, the time is 9.20 p.m. Um, emergency Management Services BB, please pause.